Okay, it started recording. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think I can start. All right. Okay, let me, cool. I'll start an intro and then we'll get going. So, hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the University Podcast. Today I'm joined with Ella Nelson, who is a Australian Olympian and also um, completing some degrees at university. Thank you so much, Ella, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, I just wanted to start by looking at the how you balance everything, especially because you um, are training so much and competing all the time. How do you balance the demanding nature of sport, like physically and mentally, um, while also kind of finding time to socialise and do everything else that you need to do? I think balance is such a... Uh key word in my life that I really try to make sure that I prioritize like for me I think that the way I kind of wrap my head around my whole life is um lists like to-do lists um calendars like I'm a very visual person so I really need to see it all laid out whether that be my training schedule or my university assignments or even just like things with my friends I like write lists always. Um, so I think for me, honestly, it's just trying to be as organized as possible and flexible within that. Like having it too rigid, rigid of a schedule is just, it's not going to work when you have such high demands, um, both with school or with um, my athletics. Uh, sometimes one will take the, the priority spot over the other, yeah. uh, depending on the time of year. And then in terms of having the energy to do everything, I drink a lot of coffee. I love coffee, <laughs> as do most Australians, and sleep. I think that it's so important to prioritise, like, your own time and, like, making sure you're getting enough sleep. And if it is a coffee that you – that keeps you going, um, maybe take that time to get that coffee by yourself so that you're fitting in your alone time amongst all of the crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And in terms of the physical, I know that, um, like, you know, you're training all day and then you're super tired and then yeah. maybe you have – assignment to do or something when you come home or something else important to do how do you motivate yourself I guess to do it to do that assignment when you're super tired your body's aching and you just want to go to sleep yeah yeah oh honestly um this one I feel like I'm still working out myself it um it is just something that you have to do um I find that training in the morning suits me better because my brain is way more active in the like afternoon and evening Um, in, I don't, I'm just not a morning person, so I'd rather get my training done in the morning and be tired in the morning. And then after that, try and regain some energy, eat some food and just, sometimes you just have to do it, especially if there's a deadline with something, it's just got to be done. And then sometimes that external motivation of having someone, um, holding you accountable or a deadline or something, it's really the way to go. Um, but yeah, just knowing your goals as well, I think is really, really important. Like knowing that every day is just a little bit, a step closer and closer to the goal that you have, whether it be, um, being on the honor roll or getting distinctions in certain class or making the Olympics, like it can be anything. Um, but making sure that you're making those little steps each day really, really help contribute to the overall motivation for sure. Yeah, totally. And I guess one thing I wanted to focus on, especially with the balance thing is, um social life and socializing because I know that's such a massive part of nations young people in general you know like going out at night or socializing with their friends Mm -hmm. so if you're training for example early in the morning but you have someone's birthday party or you know an event the night before how do you balance that because I think it's really hard to just kind of leave that to a side and just keep focused especially for something like the Olympics which you train for years to get to um mm-hmm. how do you balance that and make a decision as to when to you know go out or when to not I guess I think it's really something that you have to kind of just like assess the pros and cons of each um say it's a friend's 21st birthday and that's it's your best friend from primary school that that's yeah. something that only happens once yeah. so obviously you're gonna like the pros on that list uh, on that event are going to be a lot higher than say a Friday night at the pub with the same people who are there every week kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think it's really important to just be aware of those events and plan ahead. Like if you know that you're going to be um, going out on the Friday night for, um, and you have early Saturday morning training, maybe talk to your coach and be like, Hey, um, I, 
have this um, my friend's birthday. I know it's not the best thing and most professional thing to say as an athlete, but the reality is that we have lives as well. It's not just go, go, go all the time. Like I think I would go absolutely insane yeah. if that was the case. So yeah, just try, kind of like being organized. Um, maybe you move that important Saturday morning session to Thursday rather than having it on Saturday just for that week. Um, and at the end of the day, like if you are working towards something that is the Olympics, which happens every four years, one night isn't going to ruin all of that yeah. unless you like break your legs or something during the night out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just kind of like weighing up the pros and cons on each thing or really just knowing what's important to you at that particular time. Um, also those around you should understand your goals and needs and support you just as much as they want you to come out. Um, so I think surrounding yourself with the right people really allows you to have that aspect of socialization and still working towards your goals and working hard and whatever it might be. Um, so yeah, just making sure there's like an understanding or if you do go out and you don't drink, um, maybe you can be like, Hey guys, like I'll come out for a few hours. I'll drive you all there. Like yeah. just making it more like involved, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And um, I forgot to mention, but the reason why we're doing this over Skype is because Ella's actually in um, Phoenix training at the moment. So I just wanted to ask about your friends back home. So in Australia, do you find that you traveling so much and being in America quite a bit for training has impacted your, or even just, you know, sport at an elite level, do you find that that has impacted your friendships or relationships back home? Absolutely, for sure. I mean, I feel like it's kind of in a similar sense of when you leave high school, you do tend to lose quite a few friends just through, um, I just want to say like natural selection, like really you only had that one thing holding your friendship together. So yeah. I don't know, for me, like I do have a small circle. My friends are my family. I say that to them all the time. Like I do have a small circle, but those who are in it are very, very close to me. Um, and that we're also aware of um, the fact that time zones are different or maybe if I have a competition coming up, I am horrific. Like I get in the worst moods, but those around me are aware of it. So yeah. it makes it a lot easier to just maintain those relationships when there's like a lot of communication, um, just accepting the fact that there's time differences and that people have busy lives as well. Um just really kind of like empathizing with the other person. Like people get so worried about like time zones or when am I going to speak to this person? It's it's a yeah. factor you can't change. So you just got to work around it. It's the same with deadlines and that as well. You can't change that factor. So just have to work with it. And hopefully those who are your friends or your family. I know my mom gets upset when I don't call her every like other day. Um <laughs> But we, it's all a mutual understanding. And definitely um, I've been over here for the last four years um, since the last Olympics. Wow. So I think that everyone's kind of got used to it now and we have our schedules and like our talking time. I tend to actually um, call people on the way home from training because my training usually finishes around 2 p.m., which is 8 a.m. in Australia. Yeah. So my day is done and Australia wakes up. So I'm very fortunate in that sense. But yeah, when you're moving around the globe a lot, it can get really confusing for sure. Definitely. And there's this whole thing about like FOMO. So like fear of missing out. Oh and my God. Yeah. So when you mean- I'm the queen America, of FOMO. <laughs> <laughs> when you've been in America for four years, obviously there are events and birthday parties and, you know, people, you know, doing things. How do you deal with seeing on social media, like all your friends have had, you know, had a party or I don't know, had an event and- you couldn't be there. I don't. Honestly, I don't. <laughs> I, I am a big photo sufferer. Um, I think photos help a lot for me um, or even just FaceTiming people. A few of my friends tend to FaceTime me when they're at events, so I feel like I'm a part of it. And I think that's so nice because I'm like, oh, they're thinking of me while they're there. Yeah. Um, but Obviously, if I'm in Australia, I'm I have FOMO from America, and if I'm here, I have FOMO from Australia. So I just I'm in a constant state of FOMO. Trust yeah. me. Like, so I think for me, I'm just like, all right, what do I want to do? Or yeah, um, seeing like really big events in Australia. Um, I try to I come home like three times a year, so I just hope that those events fall around those times. And if it is something really big, obviously, like my best friend got married last year, so I planned a trip specifically for that because yeah. you have to. Yeah. Um, 
Awesome. I wanted to move on to like your, like the things you've sacrificed kind of thing. I We've kind of touched on it a little bit with um, the friendships and, you know, friends from home and stuff. But in general, what you, like not just moving away, but just pr- pursuing like being a professional athlete, what have you found that you've had to sacrifice that maybe normal everyday people might still get to do normal, um, might still get to do? Do you find that like there's some stuff you don't do? Sorry. We have this term for like the normal. It's um, a nap. It's a non-athletic regular person. <laughs> Be fine. Hilarious. Um, sacrifice. I don't like the word because it it does make me feel like I've given up something. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually had this discussion um, the first week that I came to the states with my new coach. Um, he gave me like a just a few uh, PDFs on like nutrition and um, mental resilience and just things to kind of look over and get prepared for going into the rest of the year. And on it, it said, um, it is a choice to be a professional athlete. You are not sacrificing anything. Everything you do is a choice. So if it's choosing the salad over the burger, like you are making that decision for yourself so that you can be the best that you can be. And I think really flipping your mentality around the term sacrifice, um, it's like, no, I'm choosing this. It, it really helps me because you do miss out on things and, um, maybe you do really want that candy that is looking really good in the store that day. But at the same time, it's kind of tying back in with our early conversation about balance. It really is about like we are human. If you do really want to have that candy one day, make sure you take it up because life's short and you don't yeah. really know what it's going to bring. So I think it's like 85% hard work and 15% play. That's good. Um, yeah. And also kind of on that, I want to talk about like disappointment. So um, when you're an athlete, you train so hard. Um, and then I've heard so many stories where people train so hard and then something happens like in the Olympics on their day, they false start or I don't know, something like that. How do you deal with that disappointment, especially when you've put in that much work into into it? It's it's horrible and heartbreaking, especially with something like the Olympics, which is every four years. Like that's a yeah. really long time to prepare and a really long time to then prepare for again if it does make up like mess up at the event. So it's it's just something you have to like deal with at the time, reflect, accept it, like be at peace with it because it's when you're not at peace with those disappointments like life is a roller coaster every high high has a low low to match it and I'm sure everyone can relate to that in whatever aspect of their life um comes to mind when you think of that um so for us we do have like qualifying for the Olympics and then I tore my hamstring twice in the preparation so I didn't get to race from being named on the team to stepping out on the track at Rio so for me it was just like this big 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 um like dip basically in um my whole year I was running really well I had a lot of opportunities to travel and race in all these different countries and I had that all taken away from me through an injury and it's just about accepting it and putting your best foot forward and using those disappointments as motivations to get you down from those low lows up back up to a high high um like I think of it, I visualize it as a literal roller coaster. Like we're up here, we're doing great. Something bad happens, but during that time, you got to get momentum to take you back up. So just really yeah. using those disappointments, and it is easier said than done, but I think it's really important to like accept the disappointment or understand it, work out why it happened, and make sure that it doesn't happen again. Um, that's something that I've definitely had to apply for myself in all aspects of life for sure. Wow. And just on the injury, I was actually reading about your um, the hamstring injury before Rio, and I just wanted to talk about that in particular. When you are, because our injury is such, I think, a common aspect of being an athlete. You're out there every day pushing your body. Um, how do you stay positive during an injury, especially when you know? I know I've had friends who have been injured and haven't been able to do their sport or participate in the sport for a long period of time, and they just wish they could just get out there, like it's this itching in them to just. Um, get out there and how do you stay positive in those times when you can't 
train, I guess, to your usual level? I think when we're training um, really hard towards such a big goal like the Olympics and maybe you do have a niggle or an injury that's stepping you um, back in whatever way, it's important to then kind of revise and set smaller goals. So for me, it was like, all right, um, I've torn my hamstring. At the moment, I can hardly do anything, but at the moment I can complete a walking warm up. So, okay, that's my little point for that day and it's just really about trying to be a little bit better every day um, after something like an injury and the thing is with injuries you're going to get like progression and then it'll dip but then you'll go higher again and then it'll dip and it's kind of like a up and down curve so it's just important to track your progress and really focus on those day-to-day little things that you can do to make sure that it's all ticking in the right direction because you are going to be itching to get back out there on the playing field like you're going to want that so badly and if you do everything right by the time you get there you'll probably end up being almost in better shape than um what you may have been earlier because you've been doing all these little one percenters that you may not have had the opportunity to um without that so again like flipping your thinking honestly fake it till you make it is one of my favorite sayings because you can really change your whole mentality and view on life when you kind of just almost fake it. Like I'm aware this is really bad right now, but if I think about it a different way, maybe we can turn it into a positive somehow. And then just holding on to that for sure. Right. Yeah. And in on that, like I find that when just in these days with social media and everything, there's a lot of opportunity for comparison with other people. And when mm. you're training and I, when you're training with friends or, you know, teammates, how do you combat the feeling of, I guess, like not feeling good enough or comparing yourself to somebody else and feeling down? So it's actually funny you say that because I'm in a little bit of that situation at the moment. Um, I haven't been running at my absolute best. I've had like a little bit of a lull last 18 months, um, just because of life like there's no real other way to put it I wasn't injured I had a few health problems a few um, mental health problems as well and those comparisons they come up every day for me when I step onto the track here in Phoenix I train with um this girl this girl she's my best friend uh (laughs) Jodie Williams from the UK um she's a 200 meter sprinter and she was an absolutely incredible junior she was my idol I used to look up to her um when I went to these international events as like a 16 year old I'd be like wow this girl is so amazing and now I have the opportunity to race against her and train with her every day so I have that comparison every day like this is where I want to be and I'm here um so it's really just like one foot in front of the other getting towards her and using that comparison as a good thing rather than something negative but it is definitely really really hard to um put it into a positive light um i think following people on social media who are positive influences is something that's really important um i frequently go through my following and unfollow people that I think are no longer serving me or whatever it might be. And that can change. Like maybe, for example, Steph Claire Smith was really motivating me last year, but this year she's just kind of not making me feel the best about myself or whatever it is. It's important to just like accept those changes and just try to I mean, Theodore Roosevelt has my favorite quote of all time, and that's comparison is the thief of joy. So kind of recognizing yourself, comparing yourself to someone else and then being like, okay, I know that's not good for me. That's just going to take away my happiness. I should just focus on myself. And it's always everything that I say here today is easier said than done for sure. But after you practice it for a while, it really does make a difference and helps you so much. No, definitely, and I think even well, even in the uni, um, in a in a uni light, I've often found that I put in so much work, and I'll see mm-hmm. someone else do a lot better when I feel like they haven't maybe put in that much work. Not that I know what they're doing all the time, twenty four seven, but it can be really disheartening when you feel like you haven't got what you deserve. I guess for the work you've put in. Yeah, uh, for sure. Every which aspect. is why it's important to just focus on like yeah. you and like you want to achieve rather than like looking at all the other people in the classroom and thinking or seeing their results that they get or hearing their answers to questions like it's more about okay 
what did I bring to the table or what can I learn from that answer that that guy said that was genius or yeah. whatever it might be. Definitely. And kind of on that, when you're training, you're obviously training with um, friends and teammates and stuff like that on a daily basis. But then when you head into races or Olympics, they kind of become your competition in a way because you're racing against them. Yeah. How do you balance that? Because you, you're learning and working together daily yeah. for a long period of time. And then suddenly on race day, it's like you're every man for himself, I guess. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. How do you deal with that? I think it depends on the relationship you have with each individual person for sure. Um, And know that it's not personal if someone else beats you on that day. Um, Like track is an, oh, track, I'm so American. (laughs) Athletics is an individual sport and you all have your individual lane. And if you are winning one day and she might beat you in the next race, it's okay. It's nothing personal. Um, it was actually a really, really fun moment for me going to the Olympics. I actually got a race against Jody Williams, my training partner that I mentioned earlier, in the heat and semifinal of the 200, which was like the chances of that happening was like next to nothing. My coach, he said that um, the night before we were like, what will you do if we're in the same heat? He was like, you won't be. There's nine heats. There's this many girls. Oh, wow. it, that's not going to happen. And then the list came out and lo and behold, we were in the lane next to each other and we were like, <laughs> So for me, it was really nice to have someone out there, my buddy, my best friend, when I'm about to, I'm so nervous, I'm losing my mind over the fact that this is happening. And like, we just looked at each other right before we walked out there, didn't say a word because obviously you have like respect for each other and each other's competition preparation, but we just looked at each other and gave each other a nod. And for me, that was a lot of like comfort and like, all right, we're in this together. Um, So even though it is an individual sport, it's really nice to have like your teammates or supporters both present and maybe in the crowd or at the warm-up track or watching online in Australia whatever it might be just knowing that they're with you um Mm. yeah yeah and I guess to finish up the main set of questions we've got I just wanted like your top three tips for any I guess high school university like athlete looking to step it up in their career um what kind of things should they look to do or just the tips that they should kind of try to follow? Um, I think at that uh, kind of age bracket, it's really important to just get used to chaos. Um, Try and organize yourself as best as you can and stick to like habits and routines. Creating them early will make it a lot easier for you when you no longer have the structure of high school where it's nine to three every day and then you go to training at five or with your university schedule once you graduate that's taken away from you and you have so much free time so it's important to set good habits early both organizationally or um, in terms of nutrition or whatever it might be Um, so that's definitely my number one tip is just creating good habits Um, number two is just forgiving yourself knowing that you are human life is here to be lived um we're put on this amazing planet and like sydney australia is one of the most beautiful places in the world so make sure to enjoy life and the opportunities that are given to you based upon the fact that you are in australia or the fact that you get to do this amazing sport and then i think number three is they the sky is genuinely the limit if you really want to achieve something you can do it um sometimes It just takes one person to tell you that you can do the thing and you achieve it. So to anyone listening right now or to yourself, whatever your big goal is, make it your phone password and have that in your mind at 24 seven and you can do it like genuinely, whatever our minds are the most powerful thing. And once you wrap your head around that, you can literally achieve anything. So I think that might be three tips. Okay. That wraps up our main focus questions, but some of our listeners sent in a few questions for you. So I'm just uh-huh. going to okay. them here. Um, so the first one kind of touched on during it, but what do you think of, what do you think about, sorry, before a race? Before a race, my goodness. Honestly, my head goes everywhere. There is a million thoughts running through my head. I suffer from severe nerves before races, so... 
Um, my way of combating that, I make really great playlists. I turn my music up as loud as I can and I just try to block it all out. Um, it's probably not the most functional thing, but for me, it gets me excited. It's yeah. the same playlist every time. So it's kind of like routine. I know what's coming up. I know this will calm me down. I know this will get me like ready to go. So yeah, that's kind of a way that I just block out those thoughts beforehand. And then right before a race, I try to make sure that I look around and like, see what I'm experiencing, whether it be a small meet in Sydney or the Olympics, look around the stadium and be like, wow, I really am here. I did this. Um, and then it's go time. I tied my ponytail and it's time to go. And as soon as that happens, I just focus on the race and what I have to do. Perfect. And what has, so the second one is what has professional athleticism taught you about yourself personally, or just about life pursuing it? What has it taught you? Um, are we here? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> okay, just cut it up a little bit. Ah, oh, the joy of being over in America. Um, I think, yeah, I kind of touched on it earlier, but it's genuinely that people can achieve whatever dreams that they want. And just to be encouraging of other people's dreams, because you, uh, we're all we're all human, we're all on the same planet, all trying to achieve success um, no matter how you define it or what your goal is, whether it be just graduating university or making the Olympics or winning the Olympics. Some people are happy just to make it. Some people are like, if I don't win, it's not for me. Yeah. So just really knowing that we can achieve anything and to be kind to one another and to encourage one another I think is so important um, because – at the end of the day, we're all here once, so it's important to try and do everything that we absolutely can. Definitely. Um, the next one is for running specifically, where is the balance between strength training and running itself? Because I can find I find that I can only do one of the two a day when balancing my uni schedule and work and other things. I think this is Training questions are so difficult because they're so individual to the person. Um, yeah. Like you see some types of sprinters and they're quite stocky and bulky. And then you look at me and I'm a little bit taller and leaner. So our training um, variables are completely different. But just having really good open communication with your coaches, mm -hmm. um, recording everything, like getting as much data as you can, like, just having a notes in your phone. It doesn't have to be a fancy app, but having notes and then the date. Did you sleep well last night? Why? Um, maybe that session didn't go well because I was really stressed about that uni assignment I had coming up at the end of the week. Um, yeah. Open communication with your coaches and trial and error and then research, really. It's just important to get, like, knowing yourself, knowing what your coach's philosophy is and then what the reach research is and kind of tying it all together in a big pot and seeing what happens. Yeah. No, it's not like the specific answer, but it's just, it's way too individual. Yeah. So finding what kind of works for you, I guess. Yeah, I think, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and the last one is what are some ways in which we can make sport relevant and interesting for kids? especially considering the rise of technology use and like online gaming and things like that, where more kids are, you know, not going out and running or playing sport, but they're on computer games or watching stuff. Um, this is uh, something that I am actually quite passionate about myself and Annalise Ruby, who's a 400 meter sprinter from Sydney. She also went to the 2016 Olympics. We created this academy called Shooting Stars Academy and it's um, basically two-day training camps um, for girls between the ages of 13 to 17, teaching them all about the elements of eliteness, nutrition, training, recovery, mental toughness, uh, mm -hmm. all of it. And within that, like, one of our big goals is to make sure that kids are getting out there and getting active and chasing dreams and setting goals and really being exposed to it all. So I think going forward... Um, the movement of more than an athlete, I think, might make a really big difference in this. Um, we have, with phones these days, we have direct access to 
social media platforms of the best athletes in the world. We all know that LeBron James loves Taco Tuesday and <laughs> that whole meme that he became. Um, so just kind of creating personable relationships with the fans and the young kids. And rather than looking at the gaming or the um, – social media aspect is a negative thing, working out how we can make it positive, how we can encourage kids and teenagers to continue to work out and um, chase those dreams that they have. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think like making it fun, I think the camp's such a good idea, like making it fun and making it social is really, is really great. Like I find that when I'm exercising with friends, it's so much more fun than just going out on my own and feeling like demotivated, not really wanting to go. Absolutely. Yeah. Friendships are so important um, in a sporting world because you can relate to each other or in the gym working out sense as well because you can work, you, you relate to one another. You're both going through the same pain. You both go through the ups and downs of sport or um, injuries or whatever it might be. So holding on to those people around you and creating those friendships from a young age is definitely another way to keep people coming back because it's what kept me coming back for sure. Little Athletics and those girls yeah. from – my age group at Sutherland Little Athletics are the reason why I am here today. So to Rosie, Brene, Bianca, and everyone from my group, you girls are the reason why I'm here today because of those <laughs> friendships, for sure. Yeah, just like it motivates you. Um, now, the before we wrap up, we always play a little quick game with our guests. So okay, cool. today we're playing Would You Rather. So we've right. got a question. So we have, would you rather right. never use social media again or never watch another movie or tv show oh ah, okay I'm gonna say I don't I think I'm gonna go with I'd rather never watch a tv show or movie again because social media is such a key aspect of how I communicate with home and yeah. I can definitely uh, be okay with not watching any more Netflix it's a time waster <laughs> for me as it is. So I'm all right with that. I'd rather connect with my, with my humans. Yes, perfect. The next one is be the funniest person in the room or the most intelligent person in the room. Most intelligent for sure. Because if you're intelligent, usually you're quick witted, which means you'll probably be, you might not be the funniest, but you'll probably be kind of funny. So definitely most intelligent. It's never a bad to be the smartest in the room. No, definitely. Okay. Be able to, well, I guess this one's be ironic because you already run but be able to run really fast or fly so would you oh. trade I guess would you trade running for flying or would you keep running Ooh. nah I think I'd rather run I think I'd run really really fast even faster than now so that I can <laughs> win the Olympics that'd be great um next one be able to teleport anywhere or read minds teleportation teleportation it would save me a lot of time hopefully as long as teleportation also doesn't come with jet lag I'm fine with that teleportation oh, yeah. every day I go home for dinner oh that'd be great <laughs> and then come back and last one get stuck in traffic always or always have really slow internet connection oh my god <laughs> This one was really controversial and on our Facebook, like we released it to all the listeners and there was a lot of going back and forth with this one. I think I'd rather always be in traffic because yeah. you can put on a playlist or podcast or yeah. call someone that bad internet. I cannot. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you so much, Ella. That wraps Thank up. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ellen. That wraps up our game. Thank you so much for um, coming on the podcast. It's so great to have you. Thank you for um, having me. I've had so much fun. Thank you. And thank you to all our listeners for tuning in. We'll see you on our next episode very soon. Bye. Okay. I'm going to just stop recording.